thank you all for being here today. This is the single most important session at Summit, <laughs> from my perspective. Um, so th thank you guys for being here. So uh, today we are going to look at kind of the future of you know what's going on behind the scenes with like Container Linux, RHEL, Atomic, everything. There's been a lot of questions going on, and we we really just want to want to be transparent with like our goals and where we're taking this technology. Uh, so my name is Ben Briard. I'm a product manager here at Red Hat. I focus in the container space. So this is everything from runtimes to Atomic, System D, Red Hat Core OS that we announced yesterday. Uh, everything in that space, and then I also have like one foot in OpenShift too. So that's kind of that's kind of my world. Uh, we are very fortunate today to have with us all the way from the Bay Area via Copenhagen, <laughs> Brandon Phillips. Thank you for being here, man. Um, yeah. Anyway, so uh, just a little bit of context for what we're going to cover today is we are going to start, uh, we're, we're just going to add context to this whole conversation, right? And then since we've been doing this for a while, we also want to take a look and kind of do a little bit of grading of ourselves. Like, what have we learned? What were some of the challenges over the past four years? And then also take a look at how the ecosystem has changed and evolved. Because you guys know the container space moves quickly, right? There's a lot of churn, a lot of change. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Nobody's nodding. But yeah, there is, trust me. Um, <laughs> And then uh, we'll take a look at actually Red Hat Core OS, some of the design goals and, and where we're taking the technology. Um, and then, yeah, we'll do, we'll do other cool stuff. So anyway, with that, we are going to kick this off. All right. Um, so before we dive into the technical details and the product details, uh, I wanted to provide some context on the thought process behind Core OS and uh, what the actual mission was <laughs> of everything we built. Um, so uh, it starts with um, people. And so there's a lot of people that are on the internet now. There's three and a half billion people um, on the internet. Um, and uh, the trouble is that there's only about uh, tw 29 um, million of us, uh, which is a pretty big order of magnitude difference. Um, and so we're horribly outnumbered. <laughs> um, uh, and I think this is, um, this is a pretty important um, uh, problem to solve. And uh, people think that we can just educate our way out of this or just train more uh, IT and developers. Uh, unfortunately, there's a quarter of a billion people being added to the internet um, every, every year. So um, what's happening, what, what are all these people doing? Uh, what they're doing is they're taking, um, because the dominant paradigm for software is hosted software. Uh, what they're doing is they're taking um, all this information that they're putting into their phones and their laptops and they're putting it onto servers. And this is stuff that's important to their lives. Um, it's, it's documents, it's commerce, it's uh, communications. Uh, and there are about 100 million of these things worldwide. Uh, and I would argue that we're probably not doing the best that we could possibly be doing. Um, on behalf of these people and um, the, their data. And so um, the industry average is frightening. Um, about three uh, people managing uh, each server in most organizations. Um, that's kind of uh, not great. Um, and at the large internet companies, um, there's about 100 a, a um, servers per person. Uh, they're just much more effective at managing servers. And I, I think part of the reason that they're way more effective, or the reason they're way more effective, um, is that they've developed a lot of automation around, um, around those servers and how they, they manage them over time. And so we started CoreOS with the concept of how do we ensure that um, the automation that allows for and enables um, effective management at the internet giants ends up to uh, the rest of the industry. Um, we had the tagline at the time when we started Core OS, which was uh, Google's infrastructure for everyone else. Um, naturally, there's a hashtag, hashtag Giphy. Um, and so uh, this, this was really the mission, is how do we bring automation to the rest of the industry on the back end of the servers? Why do we think that's important? It's because the security of everyone's data relies upon it. So. Um, which brings us to the very first thing that we launched at CoreOS, which was CoreOS Container Linux. Um, and CoreOS Container Linux, uh, we took advantage of this opportunity that we saw containers uh, might have. Now, the challenge for us was that the time that we started CoreOS, uh, containers weren't really a thing that was 
on the tip of everyone's tongue. Uh, Docker hadn't launched yet. Um, how many people had, had actually used containers before Docker? Let's be honest. Okay, exactly. Thank you for being honest. I've done this, uh, this survey at some conferences and everyone's raising their hand. I'm like, mm, uh. um, And so uh, the opportunity here is that containers abstract away the operating system from the application. And in Linux, for a very long time, uh, the operating system and the application were one. And what I mean by that is that very rarely were you able to write an application, deploy it to, let's say, Debian, and then have it work just totally fine if you were to later deploy it to, say, Fedora. Um, and that's because there's different versions of Python and Java and whatever, and you got these from your op operating system. The downside of this is it meant that all of us were just frightened of upgrading our operating system because what, what happens when you upgrade your operating system, your application breaks. What's your job? Well, it's not to upgrade operating systems, it's to make sure the application keeps running. So what we did was we took a traditional Linux operating system and we threw a lot of stuff out um, and we slimmed it down to a few hundred packages that essentially are enough to launch a container and SSH into it and uh, do some basic management. Um, and then applications end up in container space. I think we all know this story. Um, and so the result of this observation is that we are able to do something that was sort of novel, which is we're able to give people confidence that they're able to turn on automated updates for their server and get updates delivered on a regular cadence um, and not really think about it because they no longer have to worry about their application breaking, or at least they have to worry a lot less about their application breaking. So that's the result um, of this observation. Um, so that's the context of, of, of where CoreOS came from and, and why we felt solving this particular problem was important. So I'll hand it back over to Ben. Yeah, so hopefully everybody here is at least somewhat familiar with RHEL. Right? We've, we've been kind of doing this for 25 years now. Um, so while you know, CoreOS in early days was a new concept, right? A new modern fast moving OS. Uh, RHEL is like in the, in the more traditional bucket of distributions, right? It's package managed. Um, it's probably most famous for the support, stability, and the long life cycle, right? It's typically what we think of when we think of RHEL. The advantages of that are, are many, right? That kind of drives this ecosystem so you can, you can stabilize on something that won't, won't affect apps for, you know, 10 to 13 years, right? Um, the part that I hear people kind of skip over sometimes is like all the R&D work that we do upstream in the community. And I know a lot of people know that, but like I think it's called out really well on this slide here that like it's that combined uh, effect of like the stability today and then like building out like the requirements of the future and later versions, right? I mean, it's a huge amount of, of effort uh, goes in upstream from us that, you know, put, put those two things together. That's like a key part of the value of RHEL. So in early 2015, we GA'd RHEL Atomic Host. And the goal here was, I mean, obviously a similar thing. You don't need a whole lot of operating system to just do containerized workloads. So the big value here was bringing the stability and integration uh, from our distribution right into this model um, where we have transactional updates. We always go from known good to known good. You don't have to care when the OS updates, kind of that, that same kind of mentality, right? Um, you know, a lot of the same things apply. We obviously, we compose this in a different way than RHEL. Like the bits are the same today, but rather than do the package transaction on each server, right, we actually think of it more like that package transaction happens once at the repo level, right? So we kind of build that system centrally and then we send the deltas out to all your clients. Um, and so, the, and, and they're all the same, right? Um, this has a lot of good advantages of giving you like a read-only operating system and like flash user where the OS bits live uh, for the most part, uh, you know, and then of course you can, you gain like reliable rollbacks without sacrificing user, user data or changes to Etsy and other things like that. Um, and along with this, we brought in a lot of familiar management concepts. So while you can't type yum install Postgres, you shouldn't want to, right? Uh, but you can, you can query the system with like RPM, show me what this is built from. I can deploy with Kickstart. Cloud in it is pretty familiar to a lot of people coming from the AWS and OpenStack world. Uh, and then cool things like Cockpit. If you haven't used Cockpit, that's your, that's your homework today uh, or after the summit. All right. And now, 
And so that's kind of high level of kind of why we dove into this path in the first place. And now I think I think this is interesting. We want to take a look at kind of like lessons learned and challenges. So, so <coughs> we essentially have been delivering updates to Container Next um, for the last four years, and uh, <laughs> the container ecosystem has changed quite a bit. So wanted to walk through and give some context on some of the things that have been uh, a challenge in this last four years and some of the things that we've tried to do to adapt um, as the container ecosystem has changed. Um, so the first real challenge was um, maintaining stability versus uh, features that were coming out of the container ecosystem. This often arised inside of Container Linux as why isn't the latest Docker version shipped inside of CoreOS? Um, and that would be the question on the mailing list. Um, there are a lot of other components that also we, we had challenges upgrading and ensuring that we ship the latest features. Um, but the Docker engine was always the most user visible. And so our goal with Container Linux was always to deliver the latest upstream software uh, as quickly as was reasonable. Um, and so we would deliver the Linux kernel really rapidly after it was stabilized from kernel.org. Um, and we would release systemd pretty quickly after it, a release was cut inside of the systemd repo. Um, and we had a bunch of assumptions that first the Linux kernel API would remain stable. That is pretty much true. Uh, you can like run, it's really freaky, you can run like super old versions of Oracle database on super modern Linux kernels. Um, the other assumption was the Docker engine API would remain stable. And then the way Docker that interacted with the rest of the system would remain stable. And that the kubelet would directly consume exclusively Docker APIs so that we would have this like very clear layer cake of Linux kernel and the system D and then Docker and then kubelet. Um, and unfortunately, uh, this, this ends up being really, really uh, difficult. Um, a lot of the challenges that we would have is um, our particular configuration of the Docker engine um, with system D, there'd be strange interactions. The kubelet actually is this thing that doesn't just talk to the Docker engine API, but runs around your file system proc and sys and starts poking IP tables and, and actually is in itself uh, a manager and exploits essentially every part of the system and interacts with every part of the system, including the Docker engine. Um, and so keeping this set of software um, kind of going uh, forward and always shipping the latest release without a targeted goal um, actually ended up being really, really difficult. The next bit was in order to try to solve this, um, to solve this problem of, well, people want the latest version of Docker, maybe they want a later version of Kubelet. We tried to decouple um, the delivery of Docker and the kubelet from container Linux. And we used, we introduced a, a project called Torx to help do this. Um, the problem with this is that um, if you start to think about, oh, we'll have different pieces of software delivered in a different cadence than the rest of the system, um, now you're starting to introduce package management into the system. And um, package management has this challenge where, and this is the challenge of, of that RHEL tries to tackle is um, if you don't sort of test everything together, then uh, as time moves forward, which unfortunately it constantly is moving forward, so time's always going forward, and then um, as time moves forward, you essentially have a, a combinatorial explosion of um, testing matrix because um, you have time here forcing you to have new releases come off, and those new releases have to work with old versions as well. Um, and so uh, this starts to compromise what was a single linearized release where container Linux would have a version number and that version number would mean very specific things to we'd have a release and then you could plug in different versions of software on top of that release, um, kind of breaking down some of the value proposition and breaking down our ability to confident, competently, uh, confidently upgrade um, from one version of container Linux to the next. Um, and so we tried to package up uh, Docker Engine in, inside of Torx, and then we were running with Kubelet inside of uh, Docker. Uh, this all 
works today. I'll be demoing a Kubernetes cluster that's all running on top of this. Um, but the complications and the value that we're getting out of it uh, continue to um, be a challenge. Um, and then uh, this is, I think, an area where um, not to be down on <laughs> everything that we did, uh, but I think this is a very important thing and, and a unique thing um, that we introduced server operating systems and that Chrome OS uh, kind of brought to consumer operating systems um, was this idea of a linearized transactional update. And what I mean by linearized is that there is a timeline and you have exactly one, like one version means exactly one thing. Um, so we have a version number and everything in that version is, is um, shipped together. You can't upgrade individual components. You can't upgrade system B separate from the kernel um, inside of CoreOS. And the reason I think this is important is for a, a few things. First is that um, our testing uh, always means one thing, one, one set of software. Uh, the second is that when you're talking to users, or you're starting to build a high-level system, like, let's say, a Kubernetes cluster that's updating stuff, um, if you only have one version number to talk about, it's really easy for you to um, automate things or for users to say, hey, this is broken under this release, and you know exactly what they mean. You don't have to sort through a list of software packages because that version number represents exactly this set of software packages. Um, and so uh, I think this was a large success, with the caveat being that um, we haven't used this linearized release model to deliver a full working um, Kubernetes cluster on top of this linearized release. What we have done so far is we have container Linux, and then we always ship the kubelet outside of the operating system for the most part. Um, and so the kubelet has always been this piece of software where we know at some point the kubelet will interact oddly with system D or the kernel or something and we'll break it. And since people are running older versions of the kubelet on top of newer versions of container Linux, that will be an issue. Um, so it's been a success in that we were able to deliver containerization, but we haven't really ran this experiment with delivering a full Kubernetes stack um, for the operating system node. Um, and this is really <laughs> what I'm trying to get to here, is um, what you'd really be able, like to be able to say is, um, this Kubernetes cluster is running this version of the operating system and have that version roll out across the entire system. Um, and so the, the idea would be that um, when I upgrade to, let's say, OpenShift, uh, like let's make up a number so it's not a forward-looking statement, uh, let's say uh, 1211 of OpenShift, okay? When I, when I roll out version 12.11 of OpenShift, I want to be able to say that the operating system for 12.11, similarly to how that container Linux has one version number, the operating system for 12.11 is always version 1880 of the operating system. So you always have a direct relationship between the platform and then the software running on each machine inside the platform. We started to achieve that in Tectonic to some degree, um, but not where we'd actually drive down the version number through the entire cluster. All right, hand it back over to Ben. Trying our best to stay in frame. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, our, you know, our position <laughs> is like really a lot of the same challenges on our side, right? Um, uh, particularly with, we, we talk to a lot of customers in this space, right? And uh, when, when people are new in the container journey, you're tracking, you know, uh, projects really, really closely. They, I've got to have these 10 PRs. Have they been accepted upstream? Well, no, but they're, they probably will be tomorrow. You should have shipped it last week. You know, you get this kind of pattern. But as soon as stuff hits production, right, now all of a sudden it flips from, like, uh, maybe not so much features and just focus on the stability side. So it's, it, it's just it's interesting to see that, uh, that kind of dichotomy play out, and we see it play out all the time. Um, so I'm... Again, I don't want to be too harsh on the technology because, again, this is stuff that we consider is successful, one, and is still currently supported, all right? But there's some challenges that's going to give us context to, to kind of kind of the next chapter. So we look at operational considerations. Um, you know, we, we went into this thinking, well, if we, we'll just simplify RHEL. It's all image-based. Um, you know, everything else runs in a container. So, you know, therefore, the op side is, is easy. Um, and, and that is true. 
However, there are other considerations here, um, and, and particularly like now you got to mirror a different type of content for the OS updates, right? Especially if you're in disconnected, like a huge number of our customers run disconnected environments, um, and so it's just a new operational process, right, that has to be adopted to, to handle that, things like that. Um, you know, the, the, it's funny, the number one thing that was requested in Atomic Hub was, it, the conversation went something like this, we love Atomic, we want to build our own. Like, that was like the number one uh, request. So, uh, I am happy to say that we, we do have a project in the works for doing custom RPM Ostry composes that they're talking about next door a little bit. Uh, but anyway, it, so it's interesting, like the, the immutable model is super powerful, um, but environments and like tradition in the op space still kind of people think about like, well, this environment needs something different than this one, right? So it's, it's interesting. Um, just host add-ons is kind of kind of reminiscent of the same thing with containerization, um, like reinventing package manager, right? Because especially when you look at like, um, am I shipping a kernel module? Well, now my container user space is tied to the host, and it, it, it gets it gets really complicated. We have slick ways to doing that, but you have this like inception problem of, you know, starts with containers are great because I don't have to mess with RPMs. Well, well, but we should build containers with RPMs, right? So we can track everything in them, right? And it's like, well, we got to lock this to the host. Well, RPM will do that, so we'll we'll generate an RPM, and it'll like. Like it works, right? And it, it, but it's 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 complicated, and you get the the testing matrix uh, challenges out of it. Um, okay, so running OpenShift on Atomic, again, this is something that is supported. You can do it today. Um, but where we where we tend to run into challenges is around the life cycle and release cadence. Um, they are uh, Atomic runs on the rel train today, right? And and that was a very intentional decision that we made early on. Um, but again, there are host level dependencies of the platform, right? And we kind of move, Atomic goes at one cadence, right? And then the, the hope is that it's so easy that customers move the platform at that same cadence, right? Um, and in reality, we've seen a lot of customers want to hug versions of the platform. Uh, now, we're, we're doing a lot of work, like kind of, the, I'd say the theme of like Summit on the OpenShift side is like automated ops. I'm still optimistic that next two years we'll be here talking about automated dev, but we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Um, that was a joke. Nobody got that. It's okay. Um, uh, anyway, so again, like like the key piece uh, it is like typically it's the container runtime, right? So a version of Kubernetes and OpenShift will will expect a particular version, right? Like our update stream will will roll to the next one, and you know you need to update OpenShift, right? That's that's the pattern. All right, so looking at the ecosystem, I think it's pretty well known that process isolation kind of started back with Chiroot. This was before software projects had logos and they were branded. Uh, so that was kind of the best I could come up with. Um, but then w once, it, once it hit like mainstream Linux, we started seeing all of these implementations, right? And they're all good in their own right. But like, again, that value perspective was really different when Docker first landed. Like it was all about the runtime, right? Um, and, and I, I'd say what's changed uh, since then, and I think the, you know, you guys help a lot, is the standards we now have around OCI, right? We, we've had the image and runtime spec for, I don't know, a year or so, until uh, those reach 1.0. And we now have um, the distribution spec, which is fantastic to have standards around all of these. Um, but wh while we've seen this kind of, you know, proliferation of runtime, uh, they all have one thing in common now, not, not all, but right, we've seen the value move up to the kubelet, right? And so that's really, um, like, it's just differentiating at the runtime is far less valuable. It's, it's all about Kubernetes now. Um, okay, and so with that context, uh, I do want to talk about some design goals uh, for Red Hat Core OS. Um, our view and approach to this is really to take the best of both, right? Like, container Linux is awesome. Atomic Host is great too, right? And so there's a lot of good uh, positive things about each one that are successful that are gonna carry forward, right? Um, so we'll dive in a little bit here. So the, the image-based provisioning model is, is, is not going anywhere. Right? This gives us that consistency. It simplifies all the variables and the common matrix that can happen. Uh, and so that's, that's saying. Also, like the whole one-touch provisioning model, um, on, the, on the Atomic side, we are, gonna, we are gonna move to ignition, right? So that's something that's staying consistent from the container Linux side. 
Um, and then the automatic update model, like that's that's one of the most positive things that people people say on that they like about Container Linux, um, and and that's something that's definitely getting carried forward. But we are gonna we are gonna tweak that model a little bit, as Brandon allu alluded to a second ago. Uh, and then again, that minimal core operating system, right? That small footprint uh, is is a that's a big deal, right? Um, <laughs> we we do have customers that install. And their kickstarts and percent packages asterisk right. Um, we don't want to take that forward uh, in in this in this model. Uh, so we're going to continue on the same path. And it's actually it's an interesting challenge when you think about uh, minimization versus functionality. Like it's it's really subjective what what somebody like really really wants on that host versus um, you know versus the next person, right? I mean, you, you just bring up editors, right? Is a perfect example. Um, Anyway, and then uh, the whole concept of an embedded container stack that moves with the operating system, uh, that, that is, is not going anywhere. Um, again, when we, when we look at like the mission statement of running workloads and containers, again, that's, this is all core, core concepts coming forward. Now on the Red Hat side, there's, there's other pieces of autonomy, but the thing I want to focus on that's the highest value is that value proposition of, of RHEL. So it's that ecosystem I talked about earlier, right? Where that value of bringing that 10 to 13 year stability and that rel ABI that is in the container space, that's the, that's the big thing, right? So workloads where you want to minimize change, like rel is perfectly suited for that in the container, right? It's, we like to say it's the thing that stays the same so everything else can change, right? And that applies here to your host changing and iterating and your applications being the same. Users and communities are high value to Red Hat, and we're doing everything we can to preserve and keep everything intact and going. Um, our initial focus on Red Hat CoreOS is for OpenShift. All right, so that's on the product side. Uh, is is our first deliverable is is, is focused there, um, but it's been great to see the teams from you know Fedora CoreOS side, Red Hat, all working together on these efforts. It's been absolutely awesome, um, and. Uh, We'll touch on the community side more later, but uh, but we are looking at a slightly wider lens of use cases uh, for the for the community uh, version. All right, so with the design goals kind of in mind, this is uh, this is what the future looks like. So, Red Hat Core OS, the life cycle and release cadence will be locked and versioned and probably branched with OpenShift, right? So the whole stack moves in one cadence. Um, this is significant, right? Because we don't we don't quite do this today. Uh, and you'll also see here in my amazing uh, graphic abilities that the kubelet is part of the, com the compose. When we say compose, we mean bits that go into the operating system itself. Um, so again, this is what we're versioning on. So uh, the container stack, obviously we will be in lock sync with the Kubernetes container runtime interface, right? That's, the, that's super important for versioning things like cryo as, as well as the kubelet also. Um, and then OCI is our effectively our strategy on the runtime side. So, so staying locked in from that angle is a, is a big part of this. Uh, we've touched on provisioning, but what we haven't done is talked about uh, environments we're targeting. So uh, as we get closer to, to release, um, this is really focused at uh, cloud and vert environments. So that's the, that's the initial, initial scope here. Um, we do have a lot of interest in bare metal uh, but most of our customers are deploying in vert and cloud today, so we think this is the this is the bell curve where most people are at. Uh, however, bare metal is absolutely in scope for this, uh, but there's there's changes that have to be made on the certification side and, and things of that nature. So we we will get there, uh, but but right now the you know expect that initial target. On the update side. Uh, this is something, you know, we talked about having the, the cluster version move together, right, as that complete stack. So platform and host evolving, right, at that cluster. Rather than just having one path that everything is locked to, uh, this will give you, like, really just a better experience that's more relevant to, to OpenShift, right? Um, another thing that we're investigating right now, and this is something we'd love to hear feedback from you guys on, uh, is the concept of delivering operating system updates from the container registry, okay? So this is something we haven't done before, but the working prototypes are incredibly promising. Uh, this is something we'd like to hear back from, because the, the whole thing is, with offline environments is, is it is a challenge to mirror things, right? And so uh, probably 90% of OpenShift today runs from containers, right? Uh, so there's a, there's a 
a number you have to sync now. We have various ways to do that. Satellite makes it easy. You can script Scopio. You can do pull through on a regular registry. Um, there's a number of ways to do that. So that's kind of a, a line in the sand. But if you deliver the operating system updates that way as well, it's, it's one less operational change and one less thing to, to pull into the scope as well. Um, so anyway, that's looking promising. And that is something we'd, we'd love to hear, hear feedback from you guys on. Uh, OK, and the last bullet point here, um, as we talked about that ecosystem changing earlier, uh, there are a few projects that are probably going to fall off the truck um, that are less relevant today than they were four years ago. Um, but I, don't, I don't anticipate anything's going to be uh, like shocking or, or a surprise. I mean, we, we've kind of moved away from flannel. So I'll pick on flannel, for example, right? We will continue to support that in RHEL 7. Uh, but moving forward, probably less emphasis on that as the SDNs have moved on to you know, more in the OBS and OVN space and courier on OpenStack. So, so expect to see some of that uh, from a support side from us, a little bit less of that. You know, if I hit the laser button, it won't advance. Okay. All right, so addition, or like the Im what's the impact of running environments here? Again, Red Hat Core OS is going to be the successor to Atomic Host and Container Linux for like product supported environments, right? So from the OpenShift side, uh, Red Hat Core OS is, is where we're going and moving towards. Um, that doesn't mean we're getting away from supporting RHEL. We'll continue to have that option, right? Uh, but we do expect with the operational benefits of Red Hat Core OS that this is going to quickly become the de facto default way that people deploy, particularly, you know, like we said, the cloud and burnt environments. Um, at the, the upstream side, uh, again, uh, container Linux continues on as it is today. Um, so we're, we're, not, we're not stopping it. Um, but we are going to launch an upstream for Red Hat Core OS um, that we think is going be, gonna to be good. And we, you know, we do expect kind of the atomic community to, to move to that, right? Uh, so uh, you know, we don't have a whole lot of details on that, but, but look for that you know, later, later this year. Uh, but the whole goal, though, is to give ample runway for environments so we don't disrupt anything. Users have plenty of time to test, migrate, and take their time with this, right? So, um, but expect that uh, Atomic Host isn't going to go away. It's, it'll probably run past 7.7. Uh, be aware. And, and we do want to work on uh, migration tooling and docs so that this is, this is smooth. So, you know, one example is like you're taking your ex existing ignition configs today, running them through the new transpiler, and, and you know, converting it and going, right? All right, so just one quick hit on the community impact side. Um, again, I said earlier that we're, we're kind of all working together and converging on this from the, the development and community side, which is, which is phenomenal. Like, seeing the energy and is, is awesome. Uh, again, later this year, we are looking to, to do a launch on the community side. So think of it kind of like you're used to from other Red Hat offerings of having that, that freely available upstream. Uh, as well, and with a slightly wider lens of use cases. Uh, if you have use cases that you're using the technology for today, please come talk to us about that. We would love to learn. Um, and the Project Atomic site itself eventually will probably be phased out. Um, it won't happen right away. Uh, the repos, many of which are still active and will continue to be so, but you, you know, there will be some shuffling around there. Um, again, nothing, nothing dramatic. Don't, don't expect any whiplash over it. Uh, we'll, we'll probably, you'll probably see a lot of the runtime stuff move to the containers repo, uh, which is a logical place for them. Uh, and then, yeah, so updates on the community side, just tune into the regular channels. So CoreOS has a Google group. Fedora has 800 mailing lists. Uh, we'll hit every one, uh, you know, IRC, whatever. Uh, so we'll definitely keep everybody, everybody in the loop as we go through, go through this. Um, and Brandon, we'll turn it back over to you. Yes, yeah, so we talked a lot about <laughs> the technologies and um, where they're going. But I just wanted to give you a taste of like the container Linux integration into the Taconic platform, which was the Kubernetes platform offering from CoreOS. Um, and we're integrating a lot of these things into OpenShift now. Um, so this one I actually have a live demo for. So let me, uh, hopefully if the Wi-Fi holds out. Um, so this is the um, Taconic console. And this is a cluster that's been up for, I think, six months or so. And so one of the things that we did inside of Tectonic that was pretty unique, well, it was the, the only uh, industry offering that had this feature, um, was that similar to Container Linux, 
we um, updated the entire platform um, with kind of unattended uh, updates or untended <laughs> updates. So um, a system administrator could like click a button and the entire uh, platform was updated uh, by itself or uh, they, could, they could actually just turn on automated, completely automated updates. Um, and so uh, this button isn't very exciting because my system's constantly up to date and I didn't install an old one for you, I'm sorry. But I can talk about a little bit um, of how this actually works. So behind the scenes, we have um, a piece of software that's running in the cluster um, that is called our Kubernetes operator. Um, and what this does is it actually knows how to update Kubernetes from one version to the next. And the way that we're able to do that is that we, we um, just bear with me here, <laughs> we, we run all of the Kubernetes components on top of Kubernetes. Okay, so um, the scheduler here uh, is the actual like Kubernetes scheduler that's scheduling pods for Kubernetes, and that's running on top of Kubernetes as a Kubernetes deployment. Um, and so, is everyone following? <laughs> okay, uh, and so the, the thing that, um, this has a bunch of natural advantages. One is that we're able to write uh, Kubernetes API calls in order to upgrade Kubernetes, uh, because this holds true for the API server, it holds true for the scheduler, et cetera. And so we have this really powerful API that we can use to, to handle migrations and updates. Um, it also has a bunch of auto operational benefits in that uh, the monitoring stack that we deploy inside of Tectonic, that stack uh, also monitors all the components of Kubernetes as well. So we have all these inbuilt things that use Prometheus to alert if, say, the scheduler is not currently scheduling anything. Or we can look and alert if pods are restarting or if the pods are unhealthy. Um, we get all these natural metrics around CPU and memory, et cetera. Um, so there's a bunch of natural advantages that we get um, out of essentially um, running Kubernetes on top of Kubernetes and then having the, the, the opportunity by doing that is having these automated updates uh, flow through in, in the platform as well. Um, so that's, that's uh, kind of where we're going with this whole integration um, with OpenShift. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show was the, the way that we integrated Container Linux into all this. Um, oh, good. Perfect. Uh, just bear with me. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, 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 that. Okay. Um, so this video, hopefully, hopefully this video, video. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, this um, this grayed out screen. So this grayed out screen. Um, hmm. So what it shows. Well, I got to call it the irony is that the live demo was successful. <laughs> right. The pre-recorded one was not. <laughs> <Is that like? laughs> so the pre-recorded demo is kind of hard to uh, do live because I have operating systems updating on a cluster and it's just hard to control that. Um, and so what this pre-recorded demo shows is um, on every single node inside the cluster, you can go into the console and it'll show you what version of container Linux is running. And then um, the container Linux nodes, when they have an update available, they actually coordinate through the Kubernetes API and they say, uh, by annotating their, themselves, the, their own node, they say, uh, I have an update that's ready. And then um, when that annotation shows up, there's a thing that maintains a queue of all the machines that would like to have updates. And this controller says, all right, well, this machine, due to policy, we only allow for one machine to update, to reboot at a time for an operating system update. And so it hands out this, this uh, golden ticket to reboot to individual machines. And the machines reboot, uh, they hand the ticket back if they're successfully rebooted, and then uh, the machine is fully up to date. What this means is that we're able, to, um, we're able to control the rollout of an update across the cluster, and then we're able to do it safely because it's not until the machine comes back and says, hey, I made it back. Uh, that it gives up its ticket. So um, you can end up in a situation where you wedge the update process by one machine going down and never coming back, but then the system administrator should probably engage. Um, we want this to be automated updates, not out automated downtime. <laughs> so, so you need to have some safety mechanism, and, that, and that's the control mechanism we have. Um, and it's a beautiful demo. I wish you could have seen it. <laughs> it. It took me literally an hour to record it because it's, 
<laughs> it's hard to get the operating system to be downgraded. It, anyways, <laughs> this is really tough for me to move on from this slide. <laughs> I have a lot invested. <laughs> I have a lot invested in this. I, I don't know what it's doing. <laughs> like literally, it works fine. Maybe if I exit, will it play? Request access. Oh my goodness. Okay, well what we're gonna do is I'm gonna use my laptop, yeah. give Ben yeah, yeah, access yeah. to the video, <laughs> and then uh, and then we'll uh, we'll watch that demo because I'm not gonna give up on it. Okay, is that switch on? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so really quick, while we're pulling that up, uh, no, no. the thing I want to call out is uh, tomorrow uh, we've got a birds of a feather session for Atomic. So please come to that, talk to us. Right again. We really want to hear from you guys. Talk about you know use cases. Uh, you know we, we want everybody to participate in this. Our CEO told you if you're here, you're here to participate and be part of this. So like we expect we expect great things from you guys. Um, <laughs> I have to stall with jokes now, so I apologize. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? We've got two minutes, so you better hustle. <laughs> okay. Those are great questions. Those are easy ones to answer. Okay, here we go. So uh, this is we're going to the nodes view. We're going to the nodes view. We're scrolling down. Here's the container Linux sub subsection. You see that it's at 1688.52. Um, and what will happen is that I'm going to tell the system, oh, you need to actually update. And then you'll see it's queued for update, um, which means that it's just waiting on the controller to say you're okay to reboot. Um, at this point, the controller has said, hey, you're okay to reboot. And so this is where Torx is involved, and it's actually upgrading the version of Docker before rebooting the machine. The machine reboots, uh, and then once the machine reboots, it says it's up to date, and it's running the latest version of Container Linux. So that's the demo. So. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs>